think we're we're ready to talk about string theory now. I think talking about the background is really important though. So just what is string theory, or what does string theory purport to be? How is it explained in, uh, I don't know, popular uh, okay. media? And what is the problem that it's supposed to solve? Yeah, so actually, so, so the, the history of the theory actually goes back to, um, so before 1973, when you know Gross and other people figured out how to understand the strong interactions, there were this alternate approach to try to understand the strong interactions and it, which wasn't very successful and, and actually Lenny Susskind was one of the main people doing doing this kind of thing and what people realize is some of the the models they were trying to play around with which they hoped would explain the strong interactions you could think of them physically as that instead of quantizing a point particle that you've got a particle moving around and and it's, it's at a point and you know you've Decided to, to treat it quantum mechanically. That you 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 had some kind of some kind of infinitely thin thin kind of loop of of string, some kind of one dimensional loop, which you know, which cl classically could be maybe you could think of as a a taut string that can vibrate in various modes. Was it a closed loop at first? Well, it, it, it's it's both. It's both. You 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 want to talk about closed strings, and you also want to talk about so called open strings. Right, right. I'm just wondering open. if the earliest. Uh, pre-string theories involved a closed loop or an open I, loop? I, I guess the theories that you were, I mean, you were in some sense... Like they came out of Veneziano's, if that's how yeah. you pronounce it, his work. I imagine it would be a, it would be a, an open string because closed strings correspond to... Well, it's, I, th I think that the, the problem, the thing is you, you, kind of, you kind of need both and, um, but, the, but the simplest theory yeah, it's, a, it's really just kind of a question of mathematically. Do you, you know, do you look at kind of you've got a circle, a little thing, and do you look at kind of do you you think of that as like an interval with periodic boundary conditions that you've identified the boundary, or do you actually, you know, make some some more assumptions about an, an independent assumption of what's happening at the boundaries? But it's kind of the same. It's the same question of of, of how you've got this object which which has an infinite number of kind of possible Vibrational frequencies, classically, and um, you know whether they're on a clo an open loop or, or a clo an open string or on a on a closed loop, but um, you know so th so then each of those vibrational frequencies, you then say, okay, there's going to be a I'm going to quantize that, and so you've got a um, anyway you you you've got a, a new physical system you you can think about, and it. Um, and the idea is that when these strings are very, very small, that, that, that this should reduce to um, back to your point particle case. And, um, and so people had tried to study the strong interactions with these models, and you know, some things it kind of works for, but mostly it doesn't work. But then one, after the standard model came in with a, a, a very different and completely and much, much better explanation of the strong interactions, a few people who were quite devoted to these theories kind of kept on working on them, and they thought, you know, what else can we do with this theory? And one idea was was to try to identify one of the vibrational degrees of freedom of this thing with a graviton and use it as a, as a, as a quantum theory of gravity. So there were people throughout the late '70s working on that, and um, and and I know that Whit Witten was was always I think kind of interested in this, but he wasn't very I think he. He saw technical reasons, that, you know, that this is probably not going to work out. And then in 1984, there was um, this technical development about this, which um, I think, which convinced Witten that you know, the thing which was bothering me about these kind of theories technically is, is actually not a problem that you, that that work, and that's why he all of a sudden became quite devoted to them. Um, I'm not sure that that really is, is enough. Yeah. About so that's the. Discovery of string theory, the realization that it could serve as a quantum theory of gravity, and then is 1984 the first string theoretic revolution? Yeah, so that's okay. when. So in, in, until then, yeah, there really weren't. There was just a very small group of no, number of people on this working on it, and then there was kind of a phase transition. Within a few months, you had a, a sizable chunk of the community was starting to to think about it and work on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then. One other key development, I think, is the the second revolution. Maybe yeah. we should gloss that before. Moving yeah. On. Well, that's 
Okay, so to maybe to tell him in my own version of the history of string theory, and uh, is that, that that maybe it's also a good idea that also to say kind of what this picture was. So, so I think you know Witten. So I, I spent a lot of time trying to understand knowing Wh Witten and knowing what happened. You know why <laughs> he he to this day says he still thinks this is a great idea and this is the most promising thing. People should still think about it, and while he doesn't know how to make more progress now, it's, it's still, this is just this most fascinating thing. And why did he so fall in love with this idea? And to, to say specifically, there was a specific version of, of, of the idea that, that he, he and a lot of other people fell in love with in 1984, which was that this technical, there are these technical calculations of the kind that he, he had thought were a problem. Those, those show that the... Um, that if you try and make sense of the string theory, you can't do it in three space and one time dimensions, but you can do it if you have nine space and one time dimension. So, 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 and, and that kind of is kind of uniquely picked out. So this is a theory which, at least the simplest versions of it, only work in 10 space time dimensions. So, and there's one, one thing that continually kind of annoys me is when people say, oh, you know, string theory is this, Known to be fully consistent theory of quantum gravity is great, and that's only that's true in ten dimensions. You know, you you really only all these these claims about the consistency of string theory are about string theory in ten dimensions, and you know we don't live in ten dimensions. So you had to um, you had to explain what are you going to do with the other six, mm -hmm. and what one of the things that I think only Witten could have done is that is to you know there is to understand. The mathemat to start thinking about the mathematics of what to do with the six dimensions. One obvious, the the, the main thing they're doing is well, let, let's assume they're six dimensions, but they're very small, so we don't see them. And the 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 pos and anyway, he came up with various consistency conditions about what the six dimensions would have to satisfy in order to get. <laughs> to get supersymmetry to work out, actually, and to get various other things that people would, would like to happen. And so this was this, this so-called Calabi-Yau manifold. And, and initially, the people got very excited. There was a lot of interaction between physicists and mathematicians because mathematicians knew only a, couple of, a few examples of these Calabi-Yau manifolds. And so physicists learned that. And they said, okay, great, we just have to find out from the mathematicians what the few Calabi-Yau manifolds are. We just got to find the right one that looks like the real world, and then we're going to have this theory of everything. So that was kind of the dream of 84, 85. Um, so but, the idea was that in order for string theory to be complete, it needed these six extra dimensions, and what Witten figured out was they could be made compact into the form of these very complicated Calabi-Yau spaces, where at each point in space-time, there's sort of this tiny, very complicated Calabi-Yau space in which the strings can vibrate and move around. Yeah, and and he was, you really needed somebody like him who, the mathematics of this is quite complicated, and you know, in six-dimensional Calabi-Yau manifolds are a complicated story in algebraic geometry, and so having somebody who could understand that story and feed it back and try to use it in physics was, <clears throat> was him, and I should say, my reaction to it at the time was was quite skeptical, and and exactly for the same things that I was saying about grand unified theories and and supersymmetry. I mean, you're telling me you know you have this wonderful new theory which is includes everything and it's got all these great new symmetries, but you know it doesn't look like the real world. It's got all this other stuff in it besides the real world, and you then have to then start going into more and more contortions about how you're going to get rid of that stuff, all the extra stuff, and, and get back the real world. And this, in some sense, is the fundamental problem of string theory. It's got this huge number of new degrees of freedom, none of which we see. It's got these six extra dimensions, none, you know, which we see no evidence of. And so you have to, the whole subject then becomes about how, how do we make this stuff how do we come up with a theory of all this stuff, which ex which also explains why we never we can't see any of it, and it's a very it's a it's kind of a dubious anyway it, 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 it's not at all convincing. So I, I never I never this is why I never understood Witten's 
love affair with this theory. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it just didn't, uh, and people talk about how beautiful and wonderful and, and elegant, and et cetera, this thing is. It's just, well, you know, no, I mean, you, it's kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that, anyway, so that's pretty much the story of what happened after the first string revolution. And then, then, then there are later developments, but I would say, you know, by three or four years after, by the early 90s, people were starting to get to be like, wait a minute, you know, this, this is kind of a mess. It doesn't really work. And there was starting to be some skepticism. But then, then there's the next step of the theory, which we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, we can get to that, that second revolution in a moment. Just something that's worth noting or reflecting on for me is as a non-physicist there is so much i mean prop you would probably call it propaganda i don't want to call it that because i don't i want to be impartial normally say hype is what i do yeah <laughs> okay there's a lot of hype around string theory and there are a lot of evangelists for string theory I imagine much less now than there were ten or twenty years ago. Um, no, no, I okay. Uh, anyway, we should get to this. But I, I, anyway, I, I think the current situation is actually much more disturbing than it was back then. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, we'll get to it. But what I was just going to say is, as a non-physicist, hearing it trumpeted over and over again that there are these six extra dimensions. It at first seems very weird, but then I just start, sort of like take it for granted because yeah. I've heard it so many times from all these authority figures. And it's interesting to put myself in the shoes of somebody who's actually much more familiar with this and how crazy it sounds to them. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean you don't know. I mean, people at, at the beginning, you know, people have a, you have a very speculative idea. Maybe it's crazy, you know, people fall in love with ideas for all sorts of reasons. And I think my initial reaction to it was, well, you know, I don't, I don't think that's going to work out, but, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe. And, 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 but, I, but I also thought that, you know, it would follow the pattern that all such things happen, is that, you know, people would get excited about an idea, they look into it, and then if it didn't work after a couple of years, they'd move on to something else. And the truly bizarre part of the string theory story is that we're still here 40 years later, and you know why didn't people three or four years that you know with, with why did, why didn't people in the late eighties kind of or early nineties say okay well this isn't working out we should just give up on it and move to other things that that's I think the really hard thing to understand about this this story. Mm -hmm. Okay, well maybe the last point in the history though is that second revolution that I think took place around ninety five in ninety five. Yeah, ninety four ninety five and, and and so people. That, that starts to become a lot more complicated. So, so what people, maybe one, one way of saying it is that um, the other problem with string theory from the beginning is that it, it, it never was a fully defined theory, that you don't, um, you, you only really had a consistent theory you could write down for what kind of so-called so weakly coupled strings work. So maybe a way to say it is that if you have two of these vibrating strings, if, 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 they, only, if they interact with each other only very weakly, um, that, that there's only a very small chance that they'll affect each other. And, as, and you know, in the limit, as that chance goes to zero, you can do calculations and you, you can say things. You don't have what we would call a non-perturbative theory. And, um, so one of the, the big things, and this is what you know, Witten, I think, I think unsuccessfully, even he would agree, you know, spent huge amounts of time thinking about how do we come up with it with a better, ver a better version of string theory, something that really is consistent, and that would, that would make sense also for these strongly interacting strings. And, and what, they, um, what people were finding was that there were, you know, if you, again, if, if you look kind of at open strings and you started thinking about the possibilities of what could happen at their endpoints, and you started thinking of, the, of what could happen at their endpoints as new degrees of freedom. You could have things called brains, and you could, you could have a, an elaboration of the theory which had all sorts of interesting properties. And that, that and what, what Witten and others realize is that within, in those, these so-called brain theories, you, th those had extra kind of interesting symmetries that Theories with one kind of brains were, were related to a theory with another kind of brains. So, so there's some extra underlying structure there, which was kind of unexpected. And so Witten in 94, 95, whatever it was, he then came up with this kind of M-theory hypothesis that there is all of these different things we've been looking at are, are all related. 
And there, there's some underlying theory called M theory, which in the limits gives us these different things that we've been seeing. So it, it was kind of some, I mean, it, it was an org organizational principle about the things that we're seeing, which, which led to a lot of pred predictions about the mathematics and about how these different theories were related, which was, you know, there's a lot you could do with, and, and that was very useful. But it also came with this kind of philosophical idea that there is, there is this one underlying, that string, there, is, there, is, there are not just several kinds of string theories that I knew about, there's only one kind of a string theory. <clears throat> and all known string theories are limits, but I mean, anyway, so that, those were the words that were said then, those were the words people are still saying, but the, you know, there just wasn't a lot of evidence. It, it was always more of a, a, a dream and a hope than something that, that actually existed. Mm -hmm.